I remember my first chess competition. It was not far from where I'm sitting right now. Randart Law School Grade 3. The hall was uniformly filled with tables and chess boards and then systematically filled with nine-year-olds and it was unnaturally quiet. Then you got me, this little dude who loved playing chess with his dad, having to show his stuff for the first time. I was over the moon excited. And then, unfortunately, my second opponent beat me in four moves. Reality check. I can't help but think about how we start life on such a high. Some of us jump into school, university, our first job or marriage with such vigor. We're excited for the new. We're excited for open skies, the good life. We're off like racehorses, blinded to everything around us, fixated on our goal and running at pace. We don't really care what everyone else is doing. They're living their lives, we're living ours. We watch some succeed, others fail, others struggle. So we celebrate, we pity, we cry. Point is, we move on. Until of course you hit a bump in the road. It's nothing drastic, we learned about this. Our parents warned us about this. So we appropriately react to it. No biggie. It was just a bump, a bad day at work, an argument with the girl of your dreams, a test you didn't score too well at. It is what it is. Work harder, apologize, move on. Then reality hits, life goes on, and sometimes it just doesn't go right. The path you were on just don't seem to work out. Mistakes have stacked up like dominoes and it just seems like you can't go anywhere. For some bad choices led them to a roadblock. Addictions form from innocent experimentation. One look, one drink, an innocent experimentation has evolved into a necessity, into slavery. For others, it's just one moment, one moment of uncontrollable anger and lives are destroyed, marriages are ruined, children are estranged and bank accounts are empty. It seems nothing that you do will help. The world will somehow limit you to your greatest mistake. You need saving. Christians believe that a Jewish nobody did exactly that 2,000 years ago. When we speak about religion, we understand salvation from sin and the fear of hellfire. For some, those stories are real, and for others, it's just fable. But imagine for a moment you did buy into those stories. Imagine for a moment you did believe them. our bedtime stories become reality, even though we might not necessarily understand them. And if we can't explain something, we say, have faith, like that's supposed to substitute logic or the laws of nature. Nonetheless, we continue life, moving forward. We now accept something called religion. Our phones have new applications and our routines have new arcane traditions. We continue with life, nonetheless. It's like we have a fresh start, open skies, positivity, bigger. Then as if from nowhere, life comes back and bites you. Challenges arise, harder challenges than before. Life was supposed to be easy for the Christian. The test was supposed to be passed with flying colors. The marriage was supposed to be okay. The job was supposed to be stable. The diagnosis 
was supposed to come back with good news. It seems like we're just back to where we started. So then we start praying. The religious facade we built is crumbling down. We can't play a game anymore. And we ask, Lord, how can you let this happen? This wasn't supposed to happen. Lord, help me. St. Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, that is the second part of the Bible, had the exact same prayer. The Bible doesn't go into specifics, but it says that there was something that tormented him. He called it his fawn, a messenger from Satan. And he prayed to the Lord and asked, Lord, please remove it. And the Lord didn't. And he prayed again, Lord, take this away from me. And the Lord didn't. And then he prayed for a third time and said, Lord, stop this torment. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. What God did in that moment is remind Paul of something that happened a while ago. That Jewish nobody was God. And what seems like a crazy paradox, mankind somehow killed God. It was God's worst moment in history. It turns out it wasn't his worst. It was his most glorious. He knew exactly what he was doing. It is in weakness that God shows strength. It is in our disabilities, our lack of ability, in our broken marriages, in our country's recession, in our sketchy work environments, in this apparent apocalypse. God is not at his worst. When we are, he is at his best and he is moving the ball. We may not necessarily understand it. We may question it along the way, but God is doing something big. God is doing something so big that religion is losing its traditional limitation. God is doing something so big that logic and the laws of gravity cannot explain it. God is doing something so big that you need faith to understand. So no matter your past, no matter who you are, no matter the choices you've made, the mistakes you've made, the addictions you've suffered, the lives you had to rebuild. God has you exactly where He wants you every step of the way. We won't understand it, we may question it, but He is doing something big and He is using you as a special piece, not just a pawn. God is doing something great with your life. So no matter where you are, no matter where you find you, no matter how bad the immediate circumstance may look, His grace is sufficient for you. So wherever you are, don't fool yourself into thinking you're just a pawn. God is working on you. Don't fool yourself into thinking this is the end. God is doing something. He is moving the chessboard and watch Him move the chessboard. If you want to make that decision, if you need saving, do it now. There is no better time. I would like to pray for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for making us exactly who you want us to be. Thank you for sending us exactly where you want us to be. And Lord, even though we don't understand it, we trust you with this world. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with our economy, Lord. Lord, come into the hearts and souls of those who so desperately need your salvation. Lord, even though we don't understand what you're doing, even though we don't understand all the stories, all the theology, Lord, we understand that you died for us. And that death was not your worst moment, but your best. Amen. Thanks, Stefan. That was an awesome word. And I want to challenge you. If God is speaking with your heart at this moment, take action. Click on that link. It's in the description. It's my privilege to lead us in this giving moment where you have the opportunity to give to the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm so reminded uh, the last couple of days of the story that Jesus told the disciples uh, about a man walking through a field and he finds this treasure. He goes home, he sells everything so that he has money to buy that field. It's such a beautiful story because that man wanted the treasure. And that treasure was the most important thing to him. The, the other things faded in comparison. I have the same story in terms of tithing and, and giving money to, to the kingdom of God. When I realized that God is the most important thing in my life, I put my security not on my financial gains, but on him. I put my focus on Him. I put my security and living on Him. When that happens, giving becomes this opportunity of telling God what you believe about Him. Every time I give, I tell myself 
And I tell God, God, I trust you. I trust you more than I do my own financial stability. I trust you than I do my own work, my own job, whatever it is. I trust you more. So we've got this opportunity today and I want to challenge you. Why don't you think about it a bit? Where, where does your heart lie? I want to pray for us and then you're going to have an opportunity to uh, pay your tithes and offerings. And there's going to be two um, uh, barcodes on the screen. You can scan that, SnapScan and Zappa, and our banking details will be there on as well. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give. Father, we, we know that when we give, we are proclaiming that we trust you more than we trust our own financial stability, Lord. When we give, Father, we are saying that you are more important than our possessions, Lord. When we give, we say that you are our king. We are your servants, Lord. We serve you. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. And I pray that every person who gives would be blessed, Lord. Thank you for your provision in our lives. We trust you, Father. Amen. Thank you for being a faithful giver. The Zapper and the SnapScan codes will be on the screen and you're so welcome to use this time to give. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. You would bear my cross You would lay down your life And I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Was arrested. 
wonderful game to understand that this is what the Lord had planned for you and just have faith that the next move is still in the Lord's hands it's so fun to have you with us and we're so glad that you enjoyed this night uh, like our Facebook page and Instagram and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel don't go anywhere watch our fun videos goodbye Bad choices led them to grow up. Yeah, good choices. Yeah, bad choices. Our sketchy work environments. You know, it's a very good list. Well done, Stephen. Where? Where? I was clear with the list. That's why. Start my career off. And not see. Yeah, yeah. I just got smarter. Yeah. Uh, Is hier die queen? Is dit die belangrike een? Ja. Vir vandagse les? Die, die koning is eindelijk die belangrike een wat, wat jy moet beskerre. Ja, maar hier is vir vandag. Ja, dat is Jesus. Nou het ek heel te mal vergeet wat ek wil sê. I'm gonna do cut the cheese and boxes. <laughs> <laughs>